keep holding the children responsible. You not this, and you suspended from school, and you kicked off the bus, and you not this, and you not that. Here's your pink slip over and over again. So that student slips, slips, slip through the cracks, and then we either see them out on the streets or we see them locked up. I know what it does to a child's self-esteem. It's tragic because I know what the outcome will be. Children are great at one thing, and that's making mistakes. That's the nature of growing up. We got it wrong. We got it all twisted. Seventh grader and his friend suspended. Ninth grader was suspended for wearing rosary. Twenty Northwest school. High School students have been suspended today. And nine Huntsville students were suspended today. They're sending tens of thousands of students into the criminal justice system every year for violating school rules. America's schools are suspending and expelling students in record numbers due to a rash of zero tolerance discipline policies and an increased presence of security officers in schools. Together, these practices are pushing large numbers of our most vulnerable children out of school and into what educators, advocates, lawyers, and judges call the school-to-prison pipeline. The pipeline operates in almost every community, most likely yours too. This is how it works and why we should all be concerned. I think suspension has become kind of a default move for many school administrators that it's kind of quick, it's kind of cheap, and it's kind of easy to just kick kids out of school. Change who you are, change the mentality, change how you handle conflict. Just change the person that you are. We readily admit there's misbehavior that happens in school. Um, no, one argue, no one argues that that should go unaddressed or that we shouldn't ensure school safety for our kids. But the solution isn't to kick kids out. Make some better choices. It's not distributing drugs at school. It's not bringing weapons to school that are the most common. In fact, those serious offenses account for only about 5% of the suspensions. And the rest of them are for disruptive behavior, disrespectful behavior, smoking in the bathroom, things like this that maybe are against the rules, but should we really be kicking kids out of school for these kinds of things? It's just not productive. The first time I got suspended was in the third grade for a fight. Fourth grade was a fight. I got suspended every year after that. I got suspended in high school for having candy in my book bag. Attempted to sell. <laughs> a 2013 report by the American Academy of Pediatrics states, out of school suspensions are harmful to child development and when used too readily are ineffective deterrents. Suspensions often place the child back into the environment that may have contributed to the antisocial behaviors in the first place, thereby negating the effectiveness of a lesson learned. I haven't found any evidence that school suspension is an effective discipline tool. Yet, North Carolina's schools issue close to 260,000 suspensions each year. We see kids who in first grade, they have missed 20 days of school. They're placed in second grade, they miss 40 days of school. They're, they're just shoved on. All right. Oftentimes, they're shoved into the court system. This is made easier by the presence of security officers in our schools. We need to treat kids as they are. We need to give them a chance in life. Good evening, everyone. The reaction of so many people today was, oh, no, not again, another high school. After the shooting at Columbine, school boards across the nation hired security officers. In combination with a zero-tolerance discipline mentality, the presence of police in our schools has contributed to an alarming trend in which students' routine misbehavior is treated as criminal conduct. With zero tolerance, it says, if you do something, you'll be suspended. It's really strict, it's really rigid with respect to what teachers can do in using their discretion in handling situations in the classroom. In Wake County, for example, the authority of armed security officers often eclipses that of teachers and principals. They have the power to search students, their vehicles and lockers, test students for drugs and alcohol, plan and carry out canine searches, and much more. Many students feel like their schools are under siege. Studies show that the presence of security officers has led to a dramatic increase in arrests for minor infractions, like talking back to a security officer.
I think it's backfired. I don't think it's made schools safer at all. The intended consequences have totally been turned on its head. A typical example took place at Broughton High when two girls got into a fight over a boy. Instead of being taken to the principal's office, the girls were handcuffed, placed under arrest, and put behind bars. We got fingerprinted, and we got a mugshot picture. I've never been arrested. I don't get in trouble. Like, I don't understand. And it was just, it was terrible. I think about 40% of the cases we see in a juvenile court are school-based offenses. And we're seeing clients like mine who are in second and third grade being referred to court for things like throwing pencils um, and who are being suspended dozens and dozens of times in second grade for doing, in large part, what we would expect a second grader to do. Studies demonstrate that children most harshly affected by these disciplinary practices live in low-income minority communities, and the data is disturbing. It shows that black students are 4.2 times more likely than their white classmates to be suspended or expelled for the very same infraction. As a result, black students lose four times more school days than their white counterparts. For minority children living in poor communities, the role of the school has shifted from a ladder out of poverty into a pathway to prison. It doesn't make sense. We gotta get better. When all this fighting, alcohol, drugs, all this stuff is going on around this child who's spun, a sponge, who's soaking this up, and you want him to go through all this traumatic, dramatic stuff, and then the next day, I'm supposed to get up and go to school and function like I'm a normal kid, like there's nothing happened. Good morning to you. Good to see you again. Um, my mama had a drug problem, you know, back when I was younger. She wasn't really around like that. And my sister, she was only one year young, older than me, and we kind of looked out for each other. I grew up in a house where it was every man for himself. You know, you got 13 people, but you're living for yourself. You know, I could never buy no food and put it in the refrigerator because people might eat it. There has been times where I went to the corner store, had to steal food, just because me and my sisters, me and my sisters both had to steal food because we ain't had nothing to eat, you know what I mean? And it's been plenty of times where we had to look out for ourselves, and we'd be in elementary school, you know what I mean? Nobody processes that with these young people. So they get up the next day, and is expected to go and sit in a classroom, and they still, like, traumatized from the night before. And then you want to say, well, why aren't you paying attention and get out of my class and you're not listening. When, we, when, 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 when did we become so desensitized that we can't relate to people? Thousands of kids cuffed and kicked out of school in Colorado. And now tonight, an effort to do away with those zero tolerance in schools. It would be the biggest overhaul of school discipline in this state in more than a decade. Down the road from Columbine, the city of Denver is working to dismantle its school-to-prison pipeline. It eliminates mandatory expulsion except in cases of guns, encourages districts to limit out-of-school suspensions, and requires schools and police to report disciplinary measures taken by gender and race. Since 2003, suspensions have dropped 44 percent. Expulsions fell 57 percent. The number of students referred to police plummeted by 63 percent. Denver is not alone. School districts across the country are changing their punitive policies and investing in additional support services instead. You stay humble, you put your best face forward. A handful of schools in North Carolina, like this one, are following a new national trend. Before I got here with the programs, it was a high turnover rate in terms of suspension. Um, the principal requested me to come over and because I knew I worked with her at another school and she saw the success of the program. Right. Stay focused, girls, stay focused. With a behavioral specialist at their school, teachers remove disruptive students from their classrooms and send them to in-school suspension. There, they'll face consequences, but they'll also receive the personal attention and support they need. What I want for every child and young adult for that matter is to see that they are this great person you know, even though you act a certain way, that doesn't mean that's who you are. And, and really help them see that you have everything that you need within to be the person that you aspire or want to be. <laughs> okay. 
Isn't that I'm so proud of you. Thank you. With guidance from teachers, Curtis, who was repeatedly suspended and even arrested in high school, was able to climb out of the school-to-prison pipeline. He's now thriving as a student at Wake Forest Technical College. Meanwhile, at Broughton High in Raleigh, the girls who were arrested for fighting over a boy did not go to court because a Campbell Law School professor, John Powell, intervened. And it sounds like it made a big difference. Powell persuaded the court to allow the girls to enter a peer mediation program he runs with his law students. We reached in and we snatched them out of that system. And so we, we snatched them out of the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, it helped a lot because we Weird. came so far from what has happened. From as soon as they begin to connect on a human level, the conflict begins to fall away. It's beautiful to watch it happen. That, that's what we call the magic. Even in the poorest communities like Roanoke Rapids, educators developed an off-campus suspension program called Families Supporting Families. Okay, God, let's pull it together. Let's get it, let's get it, let's get it. In Durham, another education leader operates a school that attracts dropouts. The teens are given another chance to earn their high school diploma. S equals D over T. But programs like these are scarce in North Carolina. Unless educators and community leaders take action, the Tar Heel State will continue to push thousands of children each year into the school-to-prison pipeline. I think just realizing that it's a problem uh, will help out, because most people don't even know the problem exists. Unless you grew up in it, you, you may not even know it exists. Everything needs to be done. Work with these kids. They're minors. Their, their brains are being developed. They are impulsive. They do have issues. But we need to educate and help them rather than push them in this pipeline. I think it's up to everybody to get involved, all the way from the state level down to the local level. The, the practical reality is that to really have comprehensive, meaningful reforms, we've got to have our students and our parents and our, and our educators at the table leading the way in crafting those changes.